Um, for our last session, um, his last session, and also our last session for the conference, um, I'd like to call up to the stage again uh, for the session, Salt, Light, and Leaven, Lay People in the Renewal of the Church, Father Roger Landry. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin this morning's talk on lay people in the renewal of the church with two beautiful stories from the history of the church in the Pacific. In the late 1700s, some educated Korean lay people traveling in China found some texts from the Jesuit priests who had been missionaries there before they had been executed. Because Korea was so xenophobic, not allowing any foreigners in the country, including missionaries, they had never met a Christian. These Korean lay people started reading the scriptures in the catechetical books the Jesuits left, and searching for the truth, found that the truth had a name. They baptized each other and tried to live the faith as best they could. When finally, after they had returned to Korea, and other missionaries had been smuggled in, they found, these missionaries, that there were already 4,000 Catholics present who had never met a priest. And these Catholics knew how to behave so well that the missionaries soon discovered that they were willing to suffer for the faith, to pick up their cross daily and even die on it. There were six ferocious anti-Christian persecution waves in 1791, 1801, 1827, 1839, 1846, 1866. But none of these pogroms had the purpose that the Korean authorities wanted of intimidating those who remained out of practice of the faith. They continued to persevere. In 2014, Pope Francis went to South Korea to beatify another 123 of the great martyrs of that land. There he wanted to help not only Korean Christians today, but Catholics everywhere to ponder their example and profit from it in imitation. He stressed that Korean Catholics are ears to an impressive tradition that began and largely grew through the fidelity, perseverance, and work of generations of laypersons. He said, in God's mysterious providence, the Christian faith was not brought to the shores of Korea through priests and missionaries. Rather, it entered through the hearts and minds of Korean lay people themselves. It was prompted by intellectual curiosity, the search for religious truth. And through an initial encounter with the gospel, these first Korean Christians opened their minds to Jesus. They wanted to know more about this Christ who suffered, died, and rose again. Learning about Jesus soon led to an encounter with him. The first baptisms, the yearning for a full sacramental and ecclesial life, and the beginnings of a missionary outreach. It bore fruit in communities inspired by the early church, in which the believers were truly of one mind and one heart, regardless of traditional stratification in society, and held all things in common. This history tells us much about the importance, the dignity, and the beauty, Pope Francis concluded, of the vocation of the laity. The second example comes from Japan. Perhaps no local church, even the ancient church of Rome, has suffered enough as much for our faith as Japanese Christians, who just two generations after St. Francis Xavier brought the gospel to their shores, underwent a ferocious 42-year bloodbath that massacred almost all the priests, religious, and catechists in the country. Many of the Christians who weren't martyred, apostatized, abjuring the faith lest they suffer the fate of the martyrs. The government had no fear of the thousands of Christian orphans they had made, as well as the perhaps few Christian adults they had missed. They believed that the Christian faith would die without teachers to pass it on, not to mention without churches, bishops, priests, and sacraments. 
Christianity had been wiped out, they thought, just as they had intended. For two centuries, from 1639 to 1854, Japan was closed to all foreign influence. The few missionaries who succeeded in smuggling themselves into the country were quickly discovered, arrested, and executed. In 1854, though, for economic reasons, Japan once again opened it, its border to allow foreign businessmen to enter. The more Christian traders arrived in Japanese port cities, the greater they pressured the Japanese government to allow them to have tiny churches to minister to their needs. The government acquiesced, provided that the churches would only be for foreigners. They reminded the Japanese citizens that Christianity was still very much illegal and punishable by death. Eleven years later, something happened that I think is one of the most moving scenes in the history of the church. It's so gripping that as I remember it, I think back to hearing it for the first time from then Monsignor Timothy Dolan, the rector of the North American College in Rome, where I studied to be a priest. He's now the Cardinal Archbishop of New York. Monsignor Dolan combined his training as a church historian with the best talents of Irish storytelling. And he told the amazing tale related in a diary entry of Father Bernard Petitjean, a French priest in the Society of Foreign Missions, who came to Nagasaki to serve the foreign businessmen. After celebrating a private mass on March 17, 1865, about a month after consecrating a newly built church, Father Petitjean went to the church door where he was met by a group of Japanese on the steps. I'll let Cardinal Dolan take it from here. In a remote corner in the northeastern part of the country, Jesuit missionaries were flabbergasted to discover a tiny village where the hundred or so inhabitants gathered every Sunday to pray the Apostles' Creed, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, acts of faith, hope, and charity, acts of contrition, recite the Ten Commandments and eight Beatitudes. Shocked, they asked the people where this custom came from, only to be told by the Japanese villagers that sometime in the distant past, men whom they called fathers had taught these words to the people and anticipating their martyrdom, instructed them to memorize those formulas and to gather every Sunday to recite them together. The fathers had also assured them that one day other fathers would return to teach them more about Jesus and about his way. Ecstatic, the new missionaries blurted out, we are those fathers, only to be met by a stony, suspicious silence. The leader of the village came forward, saying, it's been passed down, too, that when men come back claiming to be those fathers, we must, we must ask them four questions to be sure they are the true church. A bit nervous, Father Petitjean responded, go ahead, ask the questions. The village leader said, when you enter your churches, what do you do? The Jesuit replied by demonstrating a genuflection, which was met by excited gas from the crowd. Second question, does your Lord have a mother? Yes, assured the priests, and her name is Mary. Whereupon more electricity spread through the people. Third question. Where does the earthly leader of your church live? In Rome, answered the missionary, as the crowd neared unrestrained joy. Finally, anxiously inquired the chieftain, do your fathers have wives? And as the priest smiled and responded, no, the villagers broke into a tumult hoisted the missionary on their shoulders and led him into the little church for the people hadn't seen a priest for 250 years. 
So great was their trust in God and in his church by those who were being killed in the 1600s that they prepared the people for the time when Catholic priests would return to Japan. And their simple instructions were passed down by the Kukure Kiristan, the clandestine Christian lay people, for a dozen generations. They had the foresight to know that Protestant missionaries might be the first to arrive. So they taught their children four marks of the church to distinguish between Catholics and Protestants. Belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. The importance of Mary, the papacy, and the priesthood. Word quickly spread among the hidden Christians of Japan that their long advent for Christ to return to their country in the Holy Eucharist was over. Within a month on Good Friday, 15,000 Christians emerged from the villages and presented themselves before the priests in Nagasaki. It was still illegal and punishable by death to show themselves in that way. But these were lay people whose faith had been nourished on the blood of so many martyrs. Many of them would die for the faith again before Christianity was decriminalized in the 1880s. But these lay people, for 250 years, kept the faith alive and strong. Both of these examples show the incredible power of the lay faithful in preserving and passing on the faith. I start with these stories because the renewal of the church needs lay people with similar faith, courage, virtue, and holy, intrepid perseverance. There's much talk today about the renewal of the church in response to new demographic realities, in response to new challenges from the modern world, especially the technological revolution, in response to the scandals, and much more. <laughs> but this is nothing really new. One of the principles of the study of the theology and history of the church is that 14th century cry, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. The church is always in need of renewal, of reform, of literally reshaping, returning to its essential form, structure, nature, mission, purifying it as the Holy Spirit forms it to respond to ever new reality. The church has been through such Famous renewals, so many such famous renewals in its history, notably with St. Benedict and Pope Gregory the Great in the 500s, Bernard of Clairvaux, Saints Francis and Dominic in the 11 and 1200s, Charles Borromeo, Ignatius of Loyola, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and others at the time of the Council of Trent, Saints John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 2nd, and Pope Benedict and others during and after the Second Vatican Council. Pope Francis is very consciously trying to lead an evangelical renewal of the church, helping her to go to the existential peripheries where so many are not yet experiencing the joy of the gospel. In every age, including our own, when the church is always in need of reform, Jesus says to us what he said to Francis on the slopes of the hill leading up to Assisi, rebuild my church, which you can see has fallen into ruins. Francis, we know, interpreted the Lord speaking to him from the San Damiano crucifix as an imperative to rebuild that dilapidated tiny church on the hillside. So he hawked his father's fabrics in order to be able to buy sufficient stones and mortar, and off he went to do that work. But the Lord had a much bigger rebuilding project in mind for Francis. It was of the church as a whole. The church is not made out of wood, bricks, glass, and mortar. It's made out of men, women, boys, and girls. What St. Peter says in his first letter, living stones built on Christ the cornerstone. The renewal that the Lord asked St. Francis to lead was a renewal of holiness to help the church become who it really is meant to be, 
precisely through renewing each person in the church so that the person becomes a living stone whose whole life is built on Christ and in communion with Peter the rock on whom Jesus built his church. While in history reforms, for the most part, have been championed by popes, bishops, founders, religious orders, and their spiritual sons and daughters, the real reform of the church happens when lay people assimilate it and live it. The lay faithful always comprise the vast majority of people in the church, after all. But more profoundly, church renewal always happens by and of this spiritual edifice built of living stones. The reform underway since the Second Vatican Council in order to renew the world has been one in which the co-responsibility of lay people has been paramount. The documents of the Second Vatican Council talk about the role of the laity in the renewal. But this renewal must be fundamentally understood within Vatican II's proclamation of the universal call to holiness, which is the Second Vatican Council's essential teaching. When I preach retreats to seminarians, which is always a joy, I always stress to them, and it originally shocks them because of the way that I state it, I just simply say, God is calling none of you to be a priest. And then I just wait as they're about to call for my crucifixion. And I said, he's either calling you to be holy priests or he's not calling you at all. The devil had tempted, the devil had tempted St. John Vianney once through a woman who was possessed. St. John Vianney is the patron saint of priests, the Cory of ours, living in southeastern France in the early to mid 1800s. He was obsessed by the devil for 35 years of his life, and the devil was really quite frightened by him. And occasionally the devil would speak to him through some of the possessed penitents whose confessions he would hear. One day, a woman came to confession, and everybody outside the confessional could hear exactly what the devil was growling. If there were three priests like you, my kingdom would be destroyed. Now, there's an interesting theological question. Can you ever believe anything the devil, the father of lies, says? For example, if I said, I'm lying, do you believe me? How do you respond? And we know the devil can say truthful things. He cried out from a possessed man, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Occasionally the devil can't but say the truth. But when, through this possessed woman, he said to St. John Vianney, if there were three priests like you, my kingdom would be destroyed. Was the devil just trying to get John Vianney proud, or was the devil stating a truth? If the devil were telling the truth, here's what it means, and I personally think he was, that the devil was more frightened by three St. John Vianney's on the entire face of the earth than all the other priests who are ordinarily good. To bring it to today's numbers, there are 435,000 priests in the world. The devil is more frightened of three like John Vianney than the other 444,997 combined. Do we focus on things that way? How important it is to be holy. Likewise, we could say that the devil would be more frightened of one true saint in the Diocese of Auckland than everybody else combined. Imagine if that were two saints, or ten, or all of us at the Eucharistic Convention. The Lord, in the reform that he wants to do, wants to do it precisely through making us holy. The summons for lay people is not just about responsibility sharing in the reform of the church. 
or about the use of their particular professional expertise to strengthen the church in those ways. All of that's important. But what's far more important is that the reform of the church has to be driven by lay people in love with God and neighbor, zealous for the faith, and truly opening themselves up to the full stature of the Christian call toward holiness. Otherwise, mass attendance numbers may go up, collection numbers may go up, Catholic schools may be built, but the genuine reform the genuine renewal wouldn't have taken place. I entitled this talk, Salt, Light, and Leaven, Lay People in the Renewal of the Church, because I wanted to emphasize by these three expressions of Jesus what he is summoning all the members of the church to be for the world. St. John Paul II, in his 1988 exhortation on the vocation and mission of lay people in the church and in the world, called in Latin, Christi Fidelis Laici, the Christian lay faithful, said, the image is taken from the gospel of salt, light, and leaven, although indiscriminately applicable to all Jesus' disciples, are specifically applied to the lay faithful. They are particularly meaningful images because they speak not only of the deep involvement and full participation of lay faithful in the affairs of the earth, the world, and the human community, but also and above all, they tell us of the radical newness and unique character of an involvement and participation that has as its purpose the spreading of the gospel that brings salvation. To understand the role of lay people in the renewal of the church means to understand much better and to live more fully these three callings which are intrinsically united. First is the salt of the earth. You remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. When Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth, he was saying something specific. In fact, he was saying three different things that his first listeners would have immediately understood because there were three purposes of salt in the ancient world. The first was as a preservative. Salt was used to preserve meat or fish from rotting. There was obviously no electricity and therefore no refrigeration in the ancient world. If any fish or meat was going to last in the sweltering Middle Eastern climate, it needed to be salted. The salt was different than the meat and the fish, pointing to the fact that as Christians we're supposed to be distinct from the world in it, but not of it. But there was something more. There was an ancient saying that the animal and the fish that were being preserved were already dead. Salt would serve almost as a life preserver, something that would keep the fish or meat fillets from likewise dying. It almost had the sense of a resurrection giving them life, whereas they, like the fish and animals from which they came, should have been dead. All of this points to the fact that Jesus calls us to be his instruments to prevent the earth from rotting, from others from going the way of corruption and death. We're supposed to keep the world and others good. We all know that there are certain people who, when they walk into a room, keep others on their best behavior, not because others are afraid of them, but because they lift others to a higher standard by the way they themselves live. Jesus wants us to be like that person. Does our presence cause others to change their behavior, to police their language, to speak more about faith, to find opportunities to serve others? Or are we inert? Or someone who by our thoughts, words, and actions drag people down rather than lift them up? Jesus calls us to be a preservative for the world. The second purpose of salt was to start a fire. I apologize if what I'm about to say may gross some people out, but it's key to grasping what Jesus says in teaching. At Jesus' time, people would take animal dung, mix it with a lot of salt, and then ignite it. The dung alone couldn't be lit on fire 
but when it was mixed with salt, the salt would be able to be lit and then would gradually heat the dung, which kept heat for a really long time. Salt was the ancient equivalent of starter wood or lighter fluid for a barbecue. Believe it or not, still in this world, in many places in Africa, dung and salt remain used for this purpose, as we're constantly reminded at the UN when we focus on the energy concerns for those in developing nations. In calling us to be the salt of the earth in this way, Jesus was reminding us of two parts of our mission. First, we see in this use of salt that salt can redeem almost anything even turning excrement into something good and useful. As salt to the earth, we're called to be God's instrument for bringing good out of the evil we encounter, to help even those who are given over to evil to start producing something worthwhile. Second, salt is a fire starter. We're supposed to be easily lit and capable of heating others up. Thus, it's totally incompatible for us to be waiting for somebody else to light a fire under us. We're supposed to be the starter wood. We're supposed to be the lighter fluid. We're called to light the world ablaze. Do we, by our presence, inflame with love, God, love for God, the others that we meet? The third and final function of salt at Jesus' time, we've maintained today, it's to give flavor to the food we consume. A little bit of salt, we know, can influence a whole meal. This points to the fact that as the salt of the earth, we're called to give flavor so that others can taste and see the goodness of the Lord. It means we're supposed to bring joy. So many in the world think that to enjoy themselves, there has to be a frat house atmosphere where there's plenty of booze, drugs, dim lights, loud noise, lots of willing members of the opposite sex, and other types of behavior that lead people to hangovers, methadone treatments, sexually transmitted diseases, and other regrettable and preventable consequences. Jesus calls us, rather, to show what real joy in life is, to be people who are happy, who are truly blessed by living together with Jesus as the cause of our joy. Jesus says to us, I have come so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. And as salt to the earth, we're called to bring that joy to the world. Jesus says, however, that for us to fulfill this mission as the salt of the earth, we have to ensure that our salt doesn't go flat. How does salt lose its saltiness? The biochemist in me will tell you that it happens when the sodium gets separated from the chloride by other cations and anions. How do we, as human beings, lose our saltiness? By getting separated from Christ, by other persons or things, by the cations of positive things and pleasures, or the anions of negative experiences, worries, and the like. And when we get separated from Christ, then we begin to lose the three qualities our salt is meant to bring to the earth. Thus, in order to maintain our saltiness, we need to maintain our bond with Jesus. We do so first by sacramental life, staying united to him through the Holy Eucharist, binding ourselves regularly to him by his mercy, living a holy life, staying united to him in charity, and especially remaining united to him in prayer. We do so by making sure that no part of our life is unconnected to Jesus. It's the first thing lay people are called to be, salt of the earth. Jesus likewise calls us all, and lay people in specific, to be light. Sermon of the Mount, he said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain can't be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. It's set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. In just the same way, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. At Jesus' presentation in the temple, the elderly Simeon called Jesus the light of revelation to the Gentiles. Later, he would fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah in Zebulon and Naphtali, that the places walking in darkness have seen a great light. 
Jesus would make totally clear later when he said, I am the light of the world, and was transfigured from the inside out to manifest that to the three apostles. Jesus, in calling us to be the light of the world, wants us to reflect the light he gives us. He sends us out as light to the world because the world still lives in the midst of so much darkness. Darkness of grief, of physical pain, of broken hearts, of depression, of ignorance, and of sin. Jesus sends us out to illumine that darkness. In the Psalms we sing, the just man is a light in the darkness for the upright. And Jesus calls you and me to be that light. Our presence is to help others see better, to see things and the most important things as they really are. There are two fundamental purposes for light. The first is to help others see for real. The second is to warm. Jesus has done both for us. He has come and mercifully taught us in such a way that we may walk as children of the light and be true children of the light. So the Christian life is supposed to be luminescent, like the lights on a landing strip at an airport on a foggy night that helps planes land. In the midst of many walking in the valleys of darkness, Christians are supposed to burn with the light so that others can follow us in following the light of the world. Similarly, light gives off warmth, and Christ has come into the world to warm us by his love, to burn away whatever in us is frigid or tepid, so that we might in turn warm others by the fire of divine love. When we approach Jesus, and when others approach us, we and they, should feel like someone cold approaching a fireplace. Jesus points out, however, that it's possible for the light to be hidden. Rather than illuminating the darkness and warming the chill of isolation, we sometimes don't live up to our identity and mission. We can worry too much about being a tall poppy and getting too noticed for the light we bear that we don't shine. We can hide our gifts under a bushel basket or we can forget what Jesus tells us in John 8, that the man who follows me will have the light of life. The only way we can truly reflect Jesus' light is to follow him. It's not enough just to know him and his teachings. We need to walk as he walked, to love as he loves, to care as he cares, to do as he does. The way we give off light for others is by following Christ so that they can follow us along this path on which Christ is guiding us. Jesus wants us to radiate what he teaches us about how to live well, how to love well, how to die well so as to live forever, to enflesh his teachings to such a degree that others see the light of his life shining from within us almost without our even trying. Jesus tells us in the gospel that the way we give off his light is through deeds of genuine Christian love that lead others in seeing those deeds to glorify God. God wants to bring us as lamps into every room of the world. We have to follow Christ along the path of charity in order to bring that light. Are we prepared to respond to his help to become the light of him who is the light of the world. And the third image comes later. Jesus gave a parable about the kingdom he was inaugurating, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of wheat flour until the whole batch was leavened. Yeast, leaven. We know that just a little bit of it is needed to raise a whole clump of dough. For the leaven is strictly speaking necessary. One Christian on a street, or in a workplace, or in a family, or in a, or in a parish, is meant to have a dramatic, transformative impact. The introduction of the leaven causes a transformation in the dough, and the coming of a Christian living in Christ's kingdom is meant to cause a transformation in the lives of those around him or her doesn't mean that it has to be conspicuous. We know that leaven works unseen, doesn't call attention to itself, but it does its work all the same. Much of the most important work of Christians 
happens through example, by our cheerfulness, by the powerful, transforming influence of good friendship, by the encouraging smiles and deeds that others need when they're down. But Jesus warns us elsewhere that there's another type of leaven at work. The leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees and of Herod, he says. The hypocritical rigorists on the one hand or the laxists on another. Just like good leaven can leaven the dough, so one bad apple can spoil the whole bushel. We're going to be leavened for good or ill. What's it going to be? Jesus wants to put us on in to lift everybody around us up. And he's got the power to do it if we have the will. So lay people are called to live out their vocations as salt, light, and leaven. To return to John Paul, these are particularly meaningful images because they speak not only of the deep involvement and full participation of the lay faithful in the affairs of the earth, the world, and the human community, but also and above all of the radical newness and unique character of an involvement and participation that has as its purpose the spreading of the gospel that brings salvation. Jesus sends us out to the whole world, but he sends us out together with him. He unites us to him as salt. He has us burn with his light. And he himself implants himself within us almost as leaven to lift up our whole life so that we can be placed in the dough of the world. Before we get very practical, I just want to make a few theological points about the laity that John Paul II gave us in his 19 exhort, 1989 exhortation. Because it will not only strengthen our understanding of what it means for lay people to be salt, light, and leaven, but it'll help prepare us for those practical suggestions. When you go to this beautiful document, which I'd urge you to read, he uses two scriptural images there. The first is from Matthew 20, about the landowner who sends out his foreman to call people at 5 o'clock in the morning, and then at 9, and then at 12, and then at 3, and then at 5 again. He wants everyone rolling up sleeves working in the vineyard. When the foreman goes out, he says, you too go. John Paul II says, this is an indication that the call to work in Christ's kingdom is addressed to everyone. Lay people are personally called by the Lord, and they receive a mission on behalf of the church and the world. Later, there's this question, why do you stand here idle? The lay faithful's hearkening to the call of Christ the Lord to work in his vineyard is essential doesn't want us to be idle, doesn't want us as a spectator in the stands, he wants each of us out there in the vineyard, on the playing field. And what is the vineyard in which the faithful are called to fulfill their mission? It's the actual state of affairs of the earth and the world, what we confront when we go out. John Paul II lists several areas for the present day situation. Secularism, where people live as if God doesn't exist. Religious indifference, in which people don't care. Outright atheism. People abandoning religious practice and wandering away. The de-Christianization of many Christian societies. This is part of the work that we have to do. So many people are like that ripe and white fruit that have to be harvested, and there's an urgency in our work. He likewise describes so many violations of human dignity when others are not recognized as God's image, the manipulation that takes place, the slavery. 40.3 million people are in modern slavery, human trafficking today. Talks about the rights that aren't respected to life, to housing, to work, to the family, to responsible parenthood, to participation in public and political life, to freedom of conscience and the practice of religion, to lack of education. He says, we need an authentic humanism, an adequate anthropology that can teach the world how to respect others for real. And he's giving that mission to those who are called to be the salt of the earth and light of the world. Likewise, there are so many situations of conflict and the lack of peace. Christians are sent out as peacemakers. We've all got the work to do at whatever time he's called us, whatever moment it is, 
there's still so many out there who will perish like fruit on a vine unless they're harvested. But the second image shows us that we are part of that vine. It's John 15, Jesus' parable of the vine and the branches. I know you know it very well, so I don't have to repeat it, but John Paul II comments, the lay faithful can't see themselves just as those laborers working in the vineyard, but they have to see themselves as part of the vineyard in order to understand who they really are. They have to find their identity in their connection to Christ. This radical newness of the Christian life comes from baptism in which we are grafted onto Jesus the vine. Three things happen to us. We become sons in the Son. We get new life capable of relating to the Father. Second, we're united to the body, the church. We become one body with others. And third, we're anointed by the Holy Spirit as if in a temple, making us a real spiritual abode of God. All three of these realities are realities that lay people are supposed to live to the full. Their divine filiation as sons and daughters of the Eternal Father, members, brothers and sisters of Christ, with all his brothers and sisters, not trying to do anything solo, and recognizing the Holy Spirit's helping us in everything we do. These are at the foundation of what it is to live out a truly lay spirituality in the middle of the world. John Paul II goes on to say, basing himself in the Second Vatican Council's teachings on the laity, that every lay person shears in Christ's life. And from the earliest days of the church, theologians have broken down Christ's life into three areas, three different activities. First is prophecy, that we shear the word of God. And lay people are called to announce the gospel that they have received. Second, a priestly character in which, baptized into Christ, they are able to offer up their entire life, their work, their sufferings, their crosses with Christ for the salvation of the world. We become co-redeemers. And third, kingly or shepherdly ministry in which we self-govern. We have self-mastery. We govern our families. We're given true responsibility for others so that we're able to organize them for the good. Ultimately, to share in Christ's Kingship is to enter into his kingdom by doing his will and helping others to enter. That all flows from the reality of our being branches on Christ the vine. St. John Paul II stressed something that can often cause confusion for lay people today because sometimes catechesis hasn't been adequate. He says the vocation of lay people has a specifically secular character. It's meant to go transform the age. It's meant to go transform the world. That's its primary locus. Second Vatican Council said the secular characters properly and particularly that of the lay faithful. The world is the place and the means for the lay people to fulfill their Christian vocation. And he says that this isn't just an anthropological and sociological reality. But in a particular way, it's a theological and ecclesiological one as well. In order to be able to understand how the church works in the world, it works as branches of Christ the vine all throughout the world. Why do I make this point? Because Pope Francis has been losing his aging vocal cords, saying that one of the problems facing the church today is so many lay people think that their role in the church is to receive delegation from the clergy to do things that the clergy should be doing. Pope Francis calls it clericalism, and he speaks about it very forcefully. He says that the whole church, the biggest reform that the church needs, is for us to leave our confines and go out to the peripheries of existence where so many people don't have the gospel. He says the inward-looking church which doesn't go out with Christ, is spiritually sick. And he said, priests are real culprits here because a lot of the times they just want to fulfill lists of lectors and extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion and people to help out with this 
apostolic outreach or the rest. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the real function of the laity. And Pope Francis says, it's key that we Catholics, both clergy and laity, go out. This is not only because our mission is to announce the gospel, but because failing to do so harms us. A church that limits herself to administering parish work, that lives enclosed within a community, experiences what someone in prison does, physical and mental atrophy. A church that merely protects its small flock, that gives all or most of its attention to its faithful clientele, he believes, is a church that's truly ill. In a 2011 interview before he was elected pope, he said this contagious spiritual sickness comes from a clericalism that passes from clergy to lay people. It's a disease. It's a cancer in the church. He says, we priests tend to clericalize lay people. We don't realize it, but it's as if we infect them with our own illness. And the laity, not all but many, sometimes ask us on, our, on their knees to clericalize them because it's more comfortable to be an adult altar server than the protagonist of a lay path. We can't fall into that trap. It's a sinful complicity. The reform that's needed, he went on to say, is neither to clericalize nor ask to be clericalized. The lay person is a lay person and has to live as a lay person with the power of baptism, which enables him to be a leaven of the love of God in society itself, to create and sow hope, to proclaim the faith, not from a pulpit, but from everyday life. And like all of us, the lay person is called to carry his daily cross, not the cross of a priest, but the cross of a lay person. The reform of the laity he said, involves reforming them to become missionary disciples in communion. These four words define, in a sense, for Pope Francis, the lay vocation. Converted followers of Jesus, who together with others who share Jesus' life, faithfully seek to spread their joy, life, and love to those who have not yet come into that twofold communion. It's a community of believers trained and inspired to go out to transform politics, society, education, neighborhoods, families, and marriages. It's a brotherhood of good Samaritans. We'll hear that in the gospel later today. Drawing near to neighbors with love and mercy. It's faithful who are the salt of the earth and not just salty critics of the church. It's a body of torchbearers radiating Christ's light rather than hiding it within the bushel basket of self-referential, spiritually worldly, and ultimately sick parochial or diocesan structures. It's possible to participate, obviously, in liturgical things according to the canons of the church. But we can't limit ourselves there or think that that's ultimately what the lay vocation is. Let's get to some practical points as we conclude. The church stresses the need to give and receive formation. In preparation for the priesthood, seminaries focus on human formation, spiritual formation, apostolic formation, and doctrinal formation. And I think the equivalent is needed in the formation of lay people. Church needs to give it, but lay people need to be encouraged to receive it. Spiritual and doctrinal formation, especially Catholic social teaching, are particularly important. But specific training in sharing the faith, as well as help with basic human issues, are likewise key. We've got to form people to keep these all together. Formation. How pleased God must be that you have taken out an entire weekend to come here to this Eucharistic convention, not just to adore the Lord, who's worthy of it, but also to receive some formation. That formation continues throughout life because persona semper reformanda. We as human beings are always in need of reshaping. There are specific activities that we need to do. Just going back to that threefold image of Jesus' prophetic, priestly, and shepherdly roles. All lay people need to participate in evangelization. 
So many people just don't know Jesus Christ. And priests and religious are not sufficient to go out to meet every single one. There are some people who will only hear the gospel from you. You're the only chance God has. And God sends the Holy Spirit to help you. But this isn't something we can pass the buck. There's not only the mission of the 12 apostles in the gospel, but the mission of the 72, which I like to interpret as here comes everybody. We need all hands on deck. Evangelization means more than just hearing about Jesus, but helping people come really to meet him and welcome him at the level with which he wants to meet them. To be evangelized literally means to live the gospel with Jesus. One of the main problems of the church today is many Christians have been catechized but not evangelized. They can tell you what the Ten Commandments are, but they just don't practice them. They can describe prayer, but they just don't make the time. We need to be evangelized evangelizers so that we can go out. Part of that evangelization effort is catechesis proper. Catechesis in families. Parents are the first catechists of their children in the ways of faith. But also catechists for others. In the United States, the greatest renewal is taking place with lay people leading this catechetical revolution. Scott Hahn and the St. Paul Center, the Augustine Institute, led by Tim Gray, Dynamic Catholic, where my twin brother works, led by Matthew Kelly, Ascension Press with Jeff Cavins on biblical theology, and Damon Owen and others teaching the theology of the body. Even Word on Fire, made famous by Bishop Robert Barron, is being expanded by the work of so many lay people. Bishop Barron couldn't do anything he does without that help. Catechesis is so essential, and lay people are leading it. Likewise, Catholic schools, which are the greatest opportunity we have to form people, but they need involvement. They need support. In many places, they don't have the financial support of the state, so that requires greater sacrifice from Catholics, like in the U.S. In other places, they do have financial support, but there are strings attached that are often getting pulled. We need to make sure that our Catholic educational institutions really shear the faith with those who enter and encourages those who are not Christian to see the best of Christianity. Catholic values aren't enough in schools. Catholic institutions need Jesus Christ, the prayer, the saints, the sacraments, because Christianity is not an ethical system, but it's a love life. It's a communion with God and others. The family needs to be evangelized to see its real dignity in the faith. Medicine, scientific research, and bioethics need to be evangelized so that we have true good Samaritans in health care. The economic fields need to be evangelized. We need to help the unemployed. We need to place the person in the center. We need new forms of entrepreneurship that can bring about new jobs. Social and cultural fields need to be evangelized, especially to help our young people. We need good movies, good books, healthy, wholesome things to do. That can happen at a parish level. In the sanctifying office of Christ, his priestly work, we can all take a more active role in prayer and teach others to pray, praying with and for others. Living a sacramental life and helping others be introduced to that new way of life. Offering up our work, our hardships, everything else in communion with what Jesus offers on that altar. When we'll pray in under an hour, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to the Lord, the Almighty Father, to God, the Almighty Father. That's when we offer our sacrifice together with Christ. That is the only fitting worship that makes sense, St. Paul said in his letter to the Romans. Then we've got the kingly or shepherdly moonness. First, we've got to have self-mastery in our personal life learning how to enter fully into Christ's kingdom and helping others to do so, living a truly ordered life with self-mastery, which is a gift to the Holy Spirit, fighting against temptations within. We need to exercise that shepherdly moonness in our homes. We need to take care of it, particularly in the charity of the church. In one area that doesn't get enough attention is we have to live this kingly moonness together with Jesus in the political sphere. Yes, there's a distinction between what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar. 
but bringing the values of God's kingdom into public discourse as participating active citizens is not an option for us. It's a necessity of who we are as salt, light, and leaven. If, we need, if we're going to prevent our culture from going down, we need to be the salt as a preservative. It's up to us to promote the dignity of the person in all the ways that it is threatened at the beginning and the end of life with abortion euthanasia. We're in the middle of the life with care for the poor, for migrants, for the marginalized and persecuted. It's up to us to defend religious freedom and freedom of conscience. It's up to us to defend the family, which is being redefined, especially by our example of living family life. We need to vote and vote consistent with the faith and help others to learn how to do so. This mission of the laity is so essential. And Jesus wishes to help us to keep our salt salty, our light burning, and our leaven in the dough of the world. These are big challenges that the reform of the church face. But Jesus tells us, as he's been telling us throughout this Eucharistic Convention, take courage. I have overcome the world. And if I'm calling you, to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and leaven. I promise to give you everything else you need to become a saint in doing so. Praise be Jesus Christ. Thanks, everybody.